Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy and today I am very, very honored to be doing a very special space champion, Dr. David Hilmers. Dr. Hilmers is currently a professor at the Baylor College of Medicine and at their Space Medicine Center. However, Dr. Hilmers was more deeply involved in the space industry, most notably known for being selected as a NASA astronaut in 1980. He is a veteran of four space flights and has been in space for over 493 hours. He is one of the most educated astronauts and truly is an inspiration for many. In his book, Man on a Mission, The David Hilmer Story, it displays Dr. Hilmer's extraordinary life as well as how it inspires every single one of us to reach even higher than the stars. I'm so excited to be able to talk with Dr. Hilmer's on his journey on a deeper level. Welcome, Dr. Hilmer's. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to conduct this interview. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, before we get started into understanding what really got you into space, first I'd like to understand what do you do on your typical day? What you know, how do, what do you currently do and how does it run? Uh, so it's it's kind of hard to describe a typical day. I, I, I would say that right now the 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 uh, major things that I'm involved in is one, I'm uh, a professor, so I I teach and see patients at uh, at my medical school in Houston. The Baylor College of Medicine. Um, secondly, I have a half-time job with NASA. Um, I, I work as a research scientist, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about what that involves as, as far as working on um, upcoming missions um, on, and medical treatment um, that you might need to, to do in space on long-term, um, long-duration um, space flights. And then the third thing I do is I, um, I'm a chief medical officer for a um, non-governmental organization, a volunteer group that um, sees uh, people in Asia and in the Pacific Islands um, that have hepatitis. And so that's my, uh, those are kind of my three things. And I, I, I would say I do a little bit of each every day, but it's hard to come up with a typical day as to exactly what I'm doing. So I may be working in the hospital one day and pretty much just be doing that, or I may be just working on my NASA work, or, um, and usually I try to do a little bit of my volunteer work every day. That's awesome. And I can see that you try to dip your feet into everything that you do. So I'm curious, what is the most exciting project or research that you have, you know, you have done or are currently working on if you had to pick one? I know it's a very difficult question. Uh, yeah, that really would, because I've I've um, done a lot of different types of research over the years, everything from malnutrition to infectious diseases like um, HIV and Ebola and uh, a lot of volunteer work. So that that's uh, that's really exciting. I think um, one of the unique projects that I think that I've been involved in has been working in the country of North Korea, which is a country that um, not many people have been to. Um, they have a, a big problem with um, hepatitis uh, there in that country. And so my wife and I, They've probably made 15, 20 trips um, there and set up clinics um, across the country and and see patients. Of course, right now with the with the epidemic going on, uh, we haven't been able to go for the past year, but we still have um, uh, a lot of interest in continuing that project uh, with all the patients that we we have on treatment for that right now. But what really is exciting about that is the fact that. Uh, we not only are able to do things that we both love, which is is working with uh, people who are sick and have a, a disease that's difficult to treat, but also what it has gone towards creating a spirit of understanding between two countries that uh, you know have a lot of fundamental difficulties. So we think that we're kind of accomplishing two things uh, when we're working on that. Wow, that, that sounds really exciting. I have never actually met someone who has been to North Korea. So that's a really, I'm sure it was a very eye-opening experience in many ways. Yes, it's um, it's it's a kind of a different world when you go there. And uh, the first time it was, it was, uh, I think a little bit, um, we were pretty anxious when you go, but then I, after you've been there a while, you find out that people are the same everywhere. They have needs and they have, um, uh, 
problems that uh, medical problems that need to be fixed and, and uh, medicine is kind of the universal uh, language in terms of everyone understands that and, and when you can provide care and take care of suffering, then people really appreciate that. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of medicine. I feel like it's something that everyone in this planet requires and we all come together in need of that. So that's really amazing. And so that leads me to my next question is you're very passionate about medicine and being a doctor. So did you always want to become an astronaut or how did you kind of transition into combining your interests in space and medicine? So I think uh, medicine has always been, to, to be a doctor has always been a dream of mine. Uh, I was always fascinated by space, but it wasn't really something that I ever uh, grew up thinking that I would be involved in. And, you know, it's a lot of times the way our life turns out is just a, a number of maybe coincidences or serendipity or luck or, you know, some, um, some greater hand that's playing a role in the way that your life turns out. And so, uh, I've just had a lot of different uh, things that have happened. Uh, I think one of the first things when I was um, going through college was that uh, the Vietnam War was going on. And so I ended up um, needing to go into the military uh, during the war. And so that kind of took me out of my thoughts of being a doctor for a while. And then while I was in the, the service, um, they gave me the opportunity to go to graduate school in uh, electrical engineering. And so I said, well, that, that, that might, may be something that's worthwhile doing. And then uh, the space shuttle program came along and I kind of realized since I had uh, gone on, gone into aviation and had been an aviator for the Marines that all these things kind of boiled up into something that NASA might want. And so it was one of those things that I had never really thought about doing. And it, it was almost more of something like, oh, I'd like to see if I, you know, I'll put my, uh, throw my hat in the ring and just see what happens, you know? <laughs> and and uh, lo and behold, I was selected. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how the astronaut part of it uh, kind of turned out. And I spent 12 years doing that. Uh, I was able, m most of the, people who are military that are astronauts just stay in the military while they're with NASA. So you're just kind of on loan with um, to the space agency while you're um, at NASA. And so that was the case for me. So I stayed in the Marines while I was in uh, at NASA. And then I guess that, that dream or that desire to be a doctor just never really went away. Um, and I think it was even accentuated during the times that I was in space because I would kind of see the world more as a whole and just thinking about the suffering that was going on I think really kept my desire there to be a, a doctor so I finally uh, after I retired from the Marines and NASA I, I, I did so with the intent of going to medical school and so I finally after all that I finally got started at medical school at the age of 42. So it was, it took a while, lots of twists and turns, but eventually I got there. Yeah, and that just shows there's no boundary in age. You could, uh, you know, already have a different career and then choose a different path or combine and fuse your interests together. And really uh, age is just a number. It has nothing to do with uh, your goals and ambitions. So I think you're a living proof of that. And so my next question for you is a lot of, um, you know, whether I'd be talking with my friends, teachers, when I talk about my interest in being a physician, but, you know, combining my interest with aerospace medicine, they're kind of a little confused. Uh, so could you explain to us, how does medicine um, in relation to like aerospace medicine, doing research in space actually translate into helping humans here um, on the ground? Well, there's, um, there's, there's a lot of similarities. Um, having worked in remote areas, I, I've worked in a lot of refugee camps and after disasters in remote area, I spent a lot of time working like with AIDS and Ebola and other diseases in, in Africa, for example. And, and being in, in remote areas is much like what it is in space. Um, and so th there's a lot, of, a lot of the things that we have come up with 
that we do in space um, that require maybe limited amount of power that you might have or doing something that you might not, uh, a lot of things that normally on earth, if you were in a well-equipped first world uh, hospital, you would be able to do with much different equipment. So we have to, when we're in space, sometimes we have to make do with what we have. And some of those discoveries also translate into things that we can do in remote areas. There are also a lot of um, physiological properties of what happens uh, in, in an environment like space where you're not under the effects of gravity or in microgravity. Um, we've learned a lot about physiology of, of humans and, and um, what may happen under those circumstances. And, and that's led to some discoveries of, about how fundamental physiology works here on earth. So it's, um, it's, it's a lot of the research and a lot of the fundamental techniques that we come up with are applicable to um, situations here on, on earth, whether it's in a first world or a developing world context. Yeah, yeah. And I know the Baylor College of Medicine has the Trish program, which is dedicated towards, you know, using the translational medicine to helping here, you know, astronauts, but also, you know, people here on Earth. So yes. that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. That's who I, my current job that I work with is actually through that group. Oh. Um, so, um, and maybe to explain a little bit more, to answer your last question, to give a little bit more specifics, is one of the, the big questions we have as we, transition from having humans uh, in low earth orbit, like in the space station, to going back to the moon and even going on to Mars is, what do you do, um, particularly in the, in the Mars missions, once you take off, you're basically don't, aren't gonna have the opportunity to come back. And so whatever you take with you is gonna have to last you and it's gonna have to um, allow you to take care of any medical emergencies that might happen. And so a really difficult question, and that's one that I'm pursuing now, is what, what, is, what makes sense um, to take on board with you? Um, you know, first of all, what kind of training do you need to give the, uh, the individuals that are on the mission in case they have to do something? Um, and then secondly, what kind of medical conditions can you possibly care for? Uh, complicated surgeries, you're just not going to be able to do. So, but there are things that you can do, and some of them require equipment. And, and so, since you are only able to take a certain amount of weight and a certain amount of so, uh, volume of, of um, equipment with you, what is it? What's the best things to take along? And so, that's not a very simple question to actually answer. And so, what we're working on now is exactly that. What are the trade offs between taking, let's say, more drinking water with you versus some medical equipment? You know, it, there's a trade off from that. And so, uh, we, we are coming up with a technique uh, using some sophisticated software models to determine what that might be. So, it's a, it's a really interesting problem and it kind of combines all the kind of things that I've done in the past, including engineering and, you know, uh, software and medicine and space flight. So for me, it's really kind of a nice thing to be doing right now. Yeah. And, you know, being able to determine, okay, this is the type of mission the astronauts are doing. This is potentially some of the, you know, if they're going to get more exposed to radiation, for example, having equipment to do something with that is important there. Whereas if they're going on short-term missions, what could be potential problems? And like kind of figuring that out is definitely uh, really important as we go into more commercial space flight in the future, which I definitely seems very interesting. And so I question that I'm curious of, and I'm sure everyone who looks up to astronauts are curious of is how was it living in space? I mean, did you expect the environment that you were going into? I know you probably had training prior, but what was it like actually living in space? Oh, well, that's a, that's a multifaceted <laughs> question. And I kind of, um, you know, as far as was it like what you expected? And, you know, we really don't have anything that trains us to be in space. You can get, you can get short bursts of zero gravity, like on a, a airplane that's making a dive or, 
you know, I guess if you jumped off a building, you would have, you know, what, what it feels like in zero gravity, but you wouldn't last very long <laughs> if you did that, obviously. So it, it, there really isn't any great uh, training um, that kind of allows you to think what it's like under, uh, in space. Uh, we would practice for spacewalks by uh, practicing underwater, but that's still not the same. It's, you know, you're kind of floating underwater. You can be, you can be put in a spacesuit and they can balance things out so you don't sink or you don't float to the surface. But it really, there really isn't any great way of kind of simulating uh, zero gravity for any extended period of time. So basically, you were just relied on watching movies of what it looked like um, and trying to uh, envision what it would be like. And then just the, uh, the, the stories that people went up before you would tell you. And I, th I think being in space is kind of a, a mixed picture. Uh, there are aspects that are uh, easier than they are on Earth. Obviously, it you don't have to uh, use as much force to get from one place to another. If you want to get from point A to point B, you basically push off a wall or something and just float on over, which is which is maybe handy in some cases. Um, it's easier to move equipment around because it's it, you know it's it's basically floating, and so you don't have to worry about its weight. Although it does have mass, and so you you don't want to push it too fast or otherwise you're gonna have, have a problem stopping it on the other side. But on the other hand, that same um, fact that you don't have to exert so much force plays, so has a lot of impact on your body and your muscles aren't, uh, don't uh, have to work the same way. Your heart gets a little um, soft in, in terms of, you know, you're not exercising all the time. Um, your bones can get brittle because you really need that kind of uh, radial force on on your bones to keep them um, keep them hard and keep them uh, in good shape. So there's that's an aspect that um, that's kind of um, a mixed bag. Uh, everything has to be tied down and so that that's it's nice to have something without weight and that you can yeah. translate it from one place to the other but on the other hand it just means that everything has to have velcro on it or something so that you can attach it you just can't put something somewhere and expect that it's just going to stay there so that's kind of a uh i think everything maybe takes is you, you just kind of have to think about everything you do whether it's eating, you have to worry about um, are there going to be crumbs that are going to be floating around as a result of what I ate when you drink something? Is it uh, is it is fluid going to escape and then it's floating around the cabin? Um, obviously, going to the bathroom take, has its own little uh, tw uh, idiosyncrasies to do. Um, so everything just has uh, has little different twists to it. You, you kind of get used to it after a while. Um, uh, there's physiologic things like because you don't have gravity pushing down on your your uh, spinal column, you actually grow maybe a couple inches while you're in space because you you have the constant gravity here that's pushing down and compressing your vertebrae, but you don't have that in space. So you grow. And so you, that's kind of a cool thought that you're now a couple inches taller than you were, but it has a downside too, because as you stretch those ligaments in your back, you tend to get um, back pain. <laughs> and so uh, as you have stretching, so everything kind of has a, a plus side and a, a, a negative side to it. Um, and usually there is some period of transition where uh, we, we call it kind of space adaptation syndrome where astronauts uh, maybe get nauseous, have a little difficulty with fluid shift as you get into orbit. Um, you don't have gravity pushing the, the fluids in your body down into distributing their, them um, equally throughout your body. And so a lot of the fluid um, in your legs will, will come up into your chest and into your face. And it's kind of an uncomfortable feeling as well until your body kind of equilibrates and 
um, urinates enough to, to kind of get rid of some of that, what it considers excess fluid. So there, there's a lot of transitions that, uh, that take place in going into space. Yeah, and are there transitions when you're coming back from space to Earth? Like, did it feel weird to be, you know, like to walk again? Yeah, it, it particularly does. Um, I remember right after uh, landing, of course, my missions were, were fairly short, you know, five to 10 days. And so it wasn't, it wasn't um, quite like it is on someone coming back from the space station for six months or even a year they have a much bigger transition. But even so, after being up for a week, uh, you would land on the shuttle. And as you, we, on the space shuttle, we would carry uh, on our backs, we'd have like a parachute and we'd, we'd have a lot of gear that we would actually have as part of our uh, launch and entry equipment that we would carry. And so as you stood up, it was like really felt, man, this is really heavy, you know, it's like, uh, it, it, it seemed a whole lot heavier um, coming back down than when you went up the first time. And, and those first few steps are, you just feel a little uneasy. But generally, I think I, I like to run a lot back in those days. And so generally, I think within the first 24 hours, I was back on the road um, running. So it, it, you, get, you get used to it pretty quick. Uh, I remember one kind of lingering thing was that I would be lying in bed trying to sleep at night after I got back and maybe for a week or so, it would feel like my body was <laughs> wanted to rise up, you know, like I was in zero gravity. So uh, it was, it, it took a little bit of getting used to that before I was uh, completely back on, uh, 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 on earth. Yeah, and you know, I when I think about space now, it's a lot more accessible than it was in the past. And so I feel like in the future, there's going to be a lot more missions and a lot more uh, ways a lot of citizens could get to go into space. Like right now, the astronauts that I grow are very qualified, very trained, um, you know, are really fit. They don't have a lot of like physical impairments, for example. In the future, I think we're going to try making the space more accessible. So what are your thoughts on making, you know, how do you believe that all, we can make space more accessible for different types of individuals, different body types, maybe, uh, you know, someone with a visual impairment. Do you think it's possible for every type of person to be able to go to space in the future one day? Oh, I, I think I think so to a certain degree. I mean, there, there's probably going to be some physical impairments that are going to make it really difficult. Um, um, but yeah, I, I think that, I think it's SpaceX that has some sort of civilian um, flight that's going up now, when I say civilian, mean non-professional astronauts. And so, I, I mean, that's really the future is here. It's, it's really here right now. And, you know, there are a number of other uh, Virgin Galactic, I think, and, and others that are going to be offering um, flights on a, com you know, commercial basis, make it a money-making proposition. And um, yeah, I think that, I think that those days are here. Um, the, I've been really quite interested in the, the new SpaceX, the, the Crew Dragon um, that has been going up and just looking at the differences in safety um, that they had, they have built into that uh, uh, vehicle as opposed to what we have had on the shuttle. And, and basically it, it seems like we're on the space shuttle there would be certain scenarios where you would lose uh, main engines during the, the ascent into, into space um, that you just couldn't recover from. But it seems like the, the uh, Crew Dragon has such a, a robust abort system that pretty much will cover almost any contingency that might happen during the uh, ascent into space. And I think uh, makes it a, a very safe vehicle to go up. And it's also to a large degree, pretty much all automated, um, which the space shuttle was as well. Um, but I think even to a greater extent than what uh, there were some actions that we needed to do uh, on our way into orbit, but it seems like it's pretty much all automated with the Crew Dragon. So I think that those kind of innovations, both the safety and the the need for fewer crew interactions 
I mean, you're always going to need to have someone that's really knows the vehicle quite well and is kind of the captain of the ship. But um, I think that it uh, lessens the need for other crew members to need to participate or learn as much about the, the crew systems, perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm kind of speculating on that. But those, those type of um, developments and in in those characteristics of the space vehicle make it possible for, um, for more and more people to go into space. Yeah, that's definitely um, an insight that a lot of people I'm sure agree with and definitely something new. And, you know, kind of diverting a little bit away from the space side, I'm curious a little bit more on your story. So were there obstacles when you're trying to pursue your passion, whether it be you know, trying to become an astronaut, becoming a doctor? And if so, how were you able to overcome these obstacles? Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> so. I, you know, there, as I was mentioning before, there are just a lot of things that are kind of by, behind your, con out of your control. It might happen, you know, world events. Um, you know, you think about COVID that we're all going through here, you know, how it really changed um, for kids in high school right now. You know, how, how has it changed? How has it changed your? Um, the way that you thought your year was going to go, how the extracurricular activities, you know, all the things that you want to do. So there, there's this list of events that happen in all our lives that whether it's an illness or something unexpected happens that just uh, you have no control over. And I, I think that that's something that just kind of says that you need to be flexible and and kind of go with the flow, you know, whatever happens, you need to be able to adapt to that. And so the, you know, the big events in, in my, uh, my life going into the military and going to NASA and, you know, that kind of, those kind of things weren't, I don't know if so much obstacles as they were opportunities. And I think that the lesson that comes from that is that, um, when something like that happens, look at it as an opportunity rather than a setback and, and try to make the best out of it. And, you know, I, I guess looking back, I was able to do that and, you know, pick up some skills and pick up, um, use those experiences to really help me in the, the phase of life that I'm in now that really, um, if I kind of look at, you know, I, I probably if I would have had my way, uh, way back when, when I was in college, I would have gone right into medical school. But now I look back and and just see the fact that all these experiences, when I find after I finally was able to go to medical school, made me a much better doctor because of the things that I've done uh, in the in the preceding 20 years prior prior to that. So uh, I think that obstacles. The big lesson from that is should be looked at as an opportunity rather than a setback. Yeah, that was beautifully said. I'm a strong believer in mindset. And so I think changing your mindset from the negative, like, oh, I've taken a step back because of this obstacle or this failure, but rather viewing it as an opportunity is a really good way to think of anything that you think is blocking or hindering your way. I think that's a really good way to change your mindset. And so my last question for you is, what advice do you have for young people regarding their pursuit of a passion in the STEM field, space industry, really any industry they want to go into, something that you wish you knew when you're maybe a high school or college student? Well, I, I think that one thing is, you know, part particularly going, um, growing up, I, I grew up, my mom was a school teacher, and I grew up in a small town in Iowa, and Iowa I think has always been a state that education has really been stressed and is important. Um, and I sometimes I would be doing subjects and particularly in the STEM fields, and I would kind of wonder what the applicability was to what I was going to be doing, even though it was kind of interesting. But you know, to to kind of realize that that foundation that you get with your uh, the classes that you may not really be that enamored with, um, but they are truly important if you want to, if you have a dream along those lines, if you want to go into some sort of STEM field. Um, I think that the other, another thing that I would say, you know, oftentimes people will ask me, what is it the I need to do to become an astronaut? And I, I kind of tell them that that's really the wrong question to ask. It's what is it that you really is your passion, as you say, you know, what is it that really drives you? What is it that's really interesting? And, you know, if it is 
going into becoming an astronaut, you have to kind of realize that, you know, the odds of of being able to do that, maybe they're going to improve as we <laughs> as we go along, you know, in the future, but they're still pretty low. And so you really need to pick something that you're passionate about. And because if you do that, if you're really passionate about it, you're going to do better at it. And if it turns out that, you know, that being with the space program isn't something that's going to turn out for you, you still have a job or you still have a field that you love. I would also encourage people to just uh, dream high. Um, you know, if if you don't decide to, if, if you don't pick a goal that maybe is a little bit beyond what you think you might be able to reach, you're, you won't get it. Definitely. I mean, if you if you really want something, you should go for it. I mean, that, that's what's really great about our country is that, you know, people like me actually exist. A lot of times when I go to other places, they'll say, well, how did you, how could you possibly do that and that, you know, it's like, well, here in the US, we, we have the opportunity to, you know, if we decide to change fields, we, we do it, you know, that it, we have those opportunities in a lot of places, whatever you have started with, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. <laughs> and so it's a great place. And so um, that's the other lesson I might want to say is that it's never too late to live out your dreams. And that was certainly the case with me that um, my I had that childhood dream and it just never went away. And uh, I was eventually able to, to do it. And then all the things that happened in between, I think that I'm doing work now that kind of combines all those experiences that I had. Yeah, that is really beautifully said. And I think, you know, part of the really the focus of the interview series is really to show individuals that you don't have to stick with one thing. Um, I think there's a misconception about the space industry. Like if you want to go into, you know, work at NASA, you just have to be, a, you know, good at physics or a mathematician or an engineer, but there's just so much more uh, highlighting diverse careers, whether, you know, a physician in space or an artist in space, there's just so many careers. And I think, you know, your story really highlights that there is not just one career you have to stick with you can branch out and combine your interests together um, and really just achieve your goals. So I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Hilmers, for taking some time out of your busy schedule to share your journey and story with us. It truly was an amazing time. Well, thank you very much. It's always fun to, to talk to young people and I appreciate what you're doing with your, your website and your, your programs that you have initiated. Thank you.